2 Corinthians chapter 1. We will begin this morning with the help of God, a sermon series through Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. I encourage you to open your Bibles, read along, see where we're going. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, this is the Word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And, aff- and, salvation. and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. But we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. We will end the reading of Scripture there. We will be meditating this morning on verses 1 through 7. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful this morning for the inspired and infallible word of God, the sure guide, place of refuge and comfort, a correct, astute teacher. We thank you that the word of God will speak to us directly and personally through the operation of your Holy Spirit. Father, teach us and give us grace. Let us hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, who longs for comfort? Who longs for mercy? Who needs consolation? Has anybody here not suffered? Has anybody here never experienced sadness, a broken heart? Some of you are suffering even as we gather together this morning. Is there anybody who can say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never experienced suffering. My life has just been awesome from the day I entered this world. If we are honest with ourselves, if we live in this world with a clear mind, we know that we suffer, have suffered, and we'll see more suffering in this life. That's the note that Paul begins 2 Corinthians with, the note of suffering and the comfort that the Lord provides. Life in a broken world makes for broken hearts. That's just the way it is in a fallen world. But we don't despair. We don't lose heart. Because we know that there is a Lord, a God in heaven, who reigns in glory, and we are his children by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have all the assurances and promises of Scripture to encourage us and bless us and teach us and tell us that that this suffering is not the final word, but the best is yet to come. And so I look forward to uh, bringing Paul's letter to you, to the Second Corinthians, a letter that really has a lot of suffering in it, but a lot of hope 
I think we need a lot of hope, especially in our day. A lot of peace comes into this letter as well. Confidence in the Lord, in His grace. What a God we have. He makes it His mission to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. This is the mission of your God. To heal your broken heart and bind up all your wounds. The theme that I've chosen for this sermon comes straight out of verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. A sharing in suffering is a prerequisite for a sharing in comfort. We're going to look at those together this morning. And so Paul begins his letter as he does other letters with a salutation. That's just a big fancy word for a greeting. So in your English Bibles, you'll see probably that editorial a note at the top of verse 1. That's the editors put that in. Paul didn't write that. It says greeting. So that's what we're calling the salutation. And then in verse 3, we get to a, a benediction, a statement of blessing. Often benedictions are what closes our service. Salutations are what begins our service, grace to you and peace. So we, we copy what the Bible does. So let's look at the salutation here. Uh, we have a salutation in the regular format. Paul introduces himself, who the letter is from, and who the letter is to. It's from Paul and Timothy, and it's to the church in Corinth and to the believers in Achaia. So we'll just look at that quite briefly. From Paul and Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Timothy is not a co-author, but a co-sender. He is with Paul, and uh, they're making their way through Macedonia when this letter is written. And Paul here identifies himself, and he identifies Timothy. He identifies himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He has identified himself similarly in his other letters, just in a brief way, um, an unpretentious way, just rolling out his credentials. Who is he? It's not, he's not Joe Blow, as we would say, but he is the apostle by the will of God. That was a point of contention between Paul and the Corinthians. You might remember from the first letter, where he had to really establish his apostolic credentials. He'll do the same in this letter. This continues to be a point of contention, and I'll bring that up even in this passage this morning. But he, he tells them that he is not an apostle by his own will. It's not something that he said, you know, I think I'm going to do this. I, I think that would be good for me. Uh, this is by the Lord's decree. Paul didn't choose this. Very similar to Martin Luther's story. Martin Luther just kind of, knocked off his donkey and swears that he will join the monastery or monastery and become a monk. And it's just the Lord's way of saying, Luther, I have other plans for you. Luther was going to be a lawyer. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee and he was doing his thing. And the Lord says, no, Paul, you're going to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And Timothy is a co-laborer. Sosthenes was the one who was working alongside of Paul when the first letter was written. But now he has Timothy at his side, a faithful son in the faith to the church in Corinth and all the believers in Achaia. Achaia is southern Greece. It's a province of the Roman Empire. And uh, so we see here Paul writing to the church. It's very beautiful. Paul describes his own status. He's an apostle. He describes their status, the church of God, the ecclesia, the called out people, called out of the world, called to be separate, called to be holy, called into sacred assembly, the church in Corinth. It's really uh, a blessing that Paul describes him in this way because the church had so many deficiencies and yet he states who they are by grace through faith in Christ, not on the basis of who they are in their own works, their own behavior. There really are, they really have been a difficult church for Paul, probably the most difficult church that he actually dealt with and yet he esteems them as the ecclesia, the called out community united to Christ by grace through faith. And so he can look at them as they are in Christ, the church of God, God's church. And he uses the same, uh, same idea when he speaks about the saints in the whole of Achaia, that the holy ones is the Greek. Again, looking at believers as they are in Christ, not as they are in their sin, not as they are in their point of sanctification, their point of growth, but as they are by grace through faith. That's how the Lord looks at you this morning. We come with our hurt, we come here with our sorrow, and we come here with our sin. And God in heaven says, I see here the church of God in Twin Falls, the holy ones. Isn't that an encouragement? 
Because we, we, we carry our guilt. We, we carry it. We confess it to get rid of it, right? But it just kind of, it's there in the background. And the Lord says, I want you to know at the outset that you are my church. You are my holy ones. What a beautiful word. With all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So the address is not only to the church in Corinth, but throughout the whole province. So we see here already the intimation that Paul expects his letters to be disseminated. They're not just for the local church, but they are to be preserved for the church of the end times, church in Twin Falls, the church in Achaia. Let it be disseminated. Let this word go forth. Copy this letter. Print it off printers and let it be distributed far and wide. Here is the salutation proper, the greeting proper. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a common salutation, a common greeting, as I already made note. Reformed worship seeks to be biblical. And so this is not a command in Scripture. I know other churches that don't begin with the greeting. They don't begin with the grace and peace. But this is something that we have done in the Reformed tradition to say this is how Paul, these letters would have been read in the church. So that's also a cue for us that Paul expected this would be read publicly and it would be heard publicly by one of the elders, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we do that not just as a form or a tradition, but after the example of Scripture. But look at it itself. Just that was a bit of an aside for a second. But, but look at the, what's being said in this greeting. The difficult church in Corinth with all their problems. God is merciful to you, grace to you, undeserved favor to you, grace to you in Corinth. You've gathered here this morning and, and we began our worship service and an encouragement for you to try to be here on time because this is, a sal this is not just a formality. We're not getting through the formalities. This is a legitimate blessing that God himself is saying, you don't want to miss the blessing, do you? This is the Lord's blessing. And he is saying to you in Twin Falls at New Covenant, grace to you all and peace. You come here this morning with a, a burdened heart, a troubled heart, anxious thoughts and cares, and the Lord just wants to say, all right, be still. Running around this way and that way. The Lord says, grace. My grace be to you with my peace. From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's greeting speaks of God the same way that Jesus did. The Pharisees never could, could summon the well, they never thought they were permitted to refer to God as Father, but Jesus did it, and it irritated them to no end. Who does he think he is calling Yahweh Father? The familiarity irked them. But you see Paul in the footsteps of Jesus? The Father of Christ is our Father. Our Father in heaven give you grace and give you peace, and from the Lord Jesus Christ as well. He puts Jesus on par with the Father. The word Lord is the most common title used of Jesus in the New Testament, and that's a very deliberate term. We think of it as meaning Lord, we are Master or King, but the word Lord used with intentionality in the New Testament is indeed the Greek word that was used in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, as the translation for Yahweh, the covenant Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when he says the Lord Jesus, he says, grace to you from God our Father and Yahweh Jesus Christ. Placing him right there next to the Father in the Trinity. This is a greeting that is sure to bless. Grace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. God is shown to be our Father through Jesus. So he puts Jesus right there beside the Father. By his incarnation, ministry, death, and resurrection, we know Christ to be our Savior and God to be our Father.
Let's see the blessing that comes, the benediction. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. That's where we're going to end right there. That is the benediction. And then he goes on to an application of it. Blessed, blessed be the God and Father. The word blessed is the Greek word from which we get the word eulogy. So you give a eulogy at a funeral, you bless the person, you tell the good things that you remember about him. This is Paul's eulogy to the Father. I want, you to tell, I want to tell you about our Father in heaven. He is wonderful. He is amazing. There is no Father like him. It's a heart enthralling doxology that begins this letter. It's just really just straight out of the gates. It's just so powerful. And listen how he writes here. Uh, first of all, in verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And then in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have, we have this benediction from our Father and from our Lord. Our Father, our Lord Jesus. How personal. And we see here the mutual love of God for us. And we see here our mutual share in him. He's not my father, he's our father, and he is our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a mutual share in the triune God. And what Paul is saying here is that the father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the father of mercies. The father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the father of mercies. Mercies in the plural, not one mercy or two or ten or twenty-two or two hundred or two thousand, but countless mercies, innumerable mercies. Mercies, as we read in Lamentations, that never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Mercies that cannot be counted because they are so many. Mercies that cannot be disseminated because they are just all over the ground that you cannot untangle them. Mercies refer to his compassion, his pity, his tender compassion. Mercy is, by, in one Greek dictionary, a deep awareness of and sympathy for another's suffering. The father of mercies looks upon his children and he pities them. That's mercy. Oftentimes in our, in our culture, we don't want people to pity us. Like, don't pity me. I'm okay. No, but, but us Christians, we want pity. Mercy is pity. Pity me. Pity me. Miserable me. H have you ever come before God in a prayer like this where you're like, Oh God, I am such a mess. I, I pray that way. Lord, I am so messed up. Feelings, thoughts, life. You ever feel like you're just messed up? Like you can't be fixed? You're not salvageable? That's the cry for mercy. Lord, I, I'm a broken heart. I'm damaged goods. We find the Father's greatest mercy in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the incarnation of pity, divine pity. He is mercy clothed in flesh. The Father in heaven pitied us in our sinful state, in our folly, in our stubborn pride. And He pitied us and He sent us His very heart which is full of pity toward us. He saw the Israelites scattered across the hillside like sheep without a shepherd, being harassed and afflicted by the Pharisees who should have been loving them and shepherding them, but were devouring them. And the Father sent his heart full of pity, clothed in the flesh. Jesus pitied them. Misery seeks mercy. 
and mercy answers with comfort. You know misery? Are you sometimes miserable? Misery asks for mercy. And mercy answers with comfort. He is the Father of mercies, the Father of Christ. And he is the God of all comfort. The word comfort here, the word paraklesis, paraclete, we sometimes sing that in our hymns. The word that is translated otherwise helper or comforter referring to the Holy Spirit, the advocate. Well, he is the God of all paraklesis, the God of all help, all comfort, encouragement, Consolation. The comfort here, as the Bible dictionary defines it, of a, per, a person feels when consoled in times of disappointment. Disappointment and discouragement are one of the most difficult burdens to bear in life. Often more challenging and difficult than just pain and suffering that comes from a wound, from an injury, or some kind of sickness. But who can... Who can heal discouragement, disappointment? The kind of comfort here we're speaking about is that a person feels when he is consoled in the midst of discouragement. And you think of Paul here who just writes in verse 8. We read that verse 8, but he says here in verse 8, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. You think, is this the Apostle Paul? Like, this is like the super apostle. He despaired of life. He was ready to throw in the towel. And God comforted him. Paul, don't be discouraged. He's not a God of some comfort, but all comfort. Not transient and momentary comfort, but comfort of all time, all the time. He's not a God of one kind of a comfort, but a God of all sorts of comfort. He is the God of all comfort. And if you look at your text, you'll see here, he is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. You see, those are parallel terms. All comfort responds to all our affliction, whatever affliction you've had. All comfort answers it. There's not an affliction that comfort cannot address. He is the God of infinite and abounding comfort that is able to address all our sorrows and afflictions. As we advance through this text, we see here in verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction. And we want to be careful as we read the scriptures. The us and the our is not the Corinthians. Paul's not saying, uh, me, Tim, me and Tim, Timothy and I and you. If you look down to verse 6, it says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort. So the we in verse 4 is Paul, principally, Timothy and the others, but mainly Paul, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we, Paul is saying, so that I may be able to comfort you. And so what we're thinking about here this morning as we're looking very closely at the text is that Paul is speaking about himself. How God has comforted him in all his affliction. And there's no letter like 2 Corinthians that dwells on this thing. We're going to come back to it again and again and again. We're going to see the various ways in which the Lord comforts us believers but just for a brief synopsis, look at verse 5. We share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. Chapter 2, verse 4. I wrote to you out of much affliction, anguish of heart, and with many tears. Chapter 4, verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Um, and we just go on there, always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Go on to chapter 6 at verse 4. He says, uh, We commend ourselves by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, etc., etc. Go on to chapter 7, verse 5. When we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every turn, fighting without and fear within. Go on to chapter 11, and you'll see here that Paul is now defending his ministry quite pointedly. And he speaks there in verse 23, 
of his far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times he was whipped at 40, 40 lashes less than one. So 39 lashes, the last five are so meant to kill. He did that five times. Beaten with rods, once he was stoned, three times he was shipwrecked. Wow. In danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from his own people, danger from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness. I mean, this, this man suffered like Job. He suffered. And if that were not enough, in chapter 12, verse 7, God gives him a gift, a messenger of Satan to harass him, a thorn in his flesh. Affliction. He bore in his flesh the scars and in his mind the trauma, the trauma of a man unjustly beaten, stoned, whipped, harassed, countless times. If anybody can speak about comfort, it must be Paul. If anybody suffered, it must be Paul. Affliction carries with, the idea, with it the idea of pressure felt inwardly resulting from the most difficult outward circumstances usually associated with Christian ministry and witness in the face of hostility. This word affliction, tribulation, it carries with that idea of an inward pressure. Your heart is like a pressure cooker because of the outward hostility associated from the gospel ministry. That's how it's being used in the Bible. In all his afflictions, Paul experienced God's comfort. There's about 30 uses of the word comfort in the New Testament. Ten of them are in these five verses. One third of the uses of comfort are in these five verses. Paul, Paul is condensing his life to its simplest truths. I have been afflicted for Christ, but he has comforted me. Again, and again, and again. When I was being lashed with whips, he was comforting me. When I was adrift in the sea, he was comforting me. When the stones fell on my head like hail, he was comforting me. He was showing me mercy and pity. How did God comfort Paul and his co-laborers? Through Jesus Christ, by his word and spirit. And this will be developed as we go through this book together, the various ways in which we also will be comforted. But just to summarize, just briefly give you a feel, what kind of comfort was Paul receiving? Assurances of God's character, God's presence, God's attributes, being assured of his love, his mercy, his grace, his goodness. Paul would have been strengthened by God's purposes and plans and God's promises. It's Paul who wrote in Romans 8.28, all things work together for the good of those who love God. It's Paul who wrote in, in the later, later chapter of Romans 8, what shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation or affliction or nakedness or peril? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. So that word that Paul received by the Spirit and wrote for our benefit was the same word that comforted him and encouraged him. So he had these assurances of God's presence, his character, his attributes, strengthened by God's purposes and plans and promises. But also what we see is an eschatological hope that would have comforted him and strengthened him. And that comes out already in this chapter. You see here in verse 9, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So you see this comfort? He's looking to the future. This eschatological means end time. It's not a hope what's going to happen tomorrow or next week, but it's a hope that's set at the end. 
the Lord raises the dead. Therefore, I have hope. And having hope, I am comforted. Chapter 4, verse 16, just very briefly, uh, same thing he says here. We do not lose heart, verse 16. And he says, our bodies are wasting away. But he says, it's working for us an eternal weight of glory. And I'm not looking at the things that are transient, but I'm looking at the things that are unseen, the eternal things. That's the eschatological hope. That's the hope that will give comfort in affliction. And so Paul himself, uh, being greatly afflicted, also will be greatly comforted. The father shows mercy and comforts his children because he is their father. The Lord will comfort you today and in the days, weeks, and years ahead because he's your father. What else could he do but comfort you? When your kid falls and injures himself or makes a bad decision and comes home, do you lock the door? Do you bring them in and comfort them? His love and his concern have no limit. He's your father in heaven through Jesus Christ. In the final point, Paul shows what usefulness his affliction will have for the Corinthians. And it will be a lesson for us, just briefly, what usefulness our suffering has for one another. And this is what we see from verses the last half of verse 4 to the end of verse 7. Sharing with Christ and his body in suffering and comfort. Paul has introduced two parallel themes in this introduction. Here are the themes that will bookend, or like the, th the two rails of the train track, that will characterize our life in these end days. Suffering and comfort. And you need both rails, don't you, for the train to go anywhere. You can't ride a train on one rail. Affliction and comfort and mercy. So those are the parallel features of the Messianic age. Paul begins this letter speaking about comfort and affliction, showing that he's tender to them. His heart is open to them. He wants to show them that he is for them and not against them. They think he's against them, but he is more for them than any other so-called apostle. He writes in verse 4, all of this is so that we, that's Paul, may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Suffering has the natural tendency to make you turn inward. We all do that. You experience loss, discouragement, suffer financial troubles, family relationships. Suffering always makes you turn inward. That's okay for a time as you, you work through it with the help of the Lord. But it can never remain there. It must always turn outward. Otherwise, it becomes unproductive even for your own soul. Suffering must make you turn outward in love to others who are suffering then it will achieve a God-glorifying usefulness. Paul has done this himself, who has been so greatly afflicted, turns it outward now in a blessing to the church. The comfort that Paul gives and we give must be the comfort that we have been given from our Father. You see that in verse 4. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. So think about this, that as you minister to those who are hurting you're ministering them not with some comfort that you have thought would be beneficial or the comfort that we might see in the world you know you, what do you see in the world it's like somebody's really dis discouraged and you just say well let's just get drunk together that's kind of how the world comforts each other or let's just get your mind off it'll just take you on a we'll go to a, ret a retreat center we'll go skiing on the slopes we'll just kind of that's what the world's going to do, right? Let's try, try to get your mind off of it. They have different ways in which they will comfort their friends and family. But we comfort with the comfort that we have received from God. Sometimes through the means of another friend or believer, right? 
but we're comforting with the comfort that God has comforted us. So in our hugs and our tears, when we're sitting on the couch beside them or in front of them, in our words and our cards and our letters and our texts, we're giving them the comfort from God that we have received. See how personal that is? We do not stand aloof to suffering. When you are there to comfort somebody else, don't spend too much time talking about your own suffering. They don't want to hear more suffering than what they're already dealing with. You might give them a sentence or two that, that shows that you can relate to it, that you have some idea, perhaps, of what they're going through, and that can be helpful and beneficial. But having been comforted yourself in your affliction, you will remember what comforted you. You will remember how tender you were, how weak, how vulnerable, how scared. You will remember, perhaps, that you do not wish to be preached at, how to be corrected and fixed. You might remember more the presence and the quiet words, I'm so sorry, and a prayer that lifted up your spirits. You will remember to show tenderness and meekness. You will weep with those who weep. Paul experienced so much suffering and affliction, which equipped him to be able to sensitively comfort the Corinthians, even as the Lord had comforted him. He knows that they are suffering. In verse 16, he says, if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort. What's interesting in this dynamic is that some of their affliction is from Paul. You see, not all affliction is persecution. Sometimes a lot of affliction is correction. Paul has been a good father to them. He has chastened them. He has rebuked them. He's been hard on them in love. He knows that some of their suffering is from his own rod. But he will love on them. And he will give them the comfort of Christ. He speaks later on in this chapter about a very painful visit that he made with them. He references a severe letter that he sent to them. This 2 Corinthians is actually the fourth letter that he sent to the church. 3 Corinthians has not been preserved for us, far too personal. Far too painful. Yes, they're hurting, but he's come there to help them as a father. Even a father who spanks his child will, as soon as the spanking is over, take the child onto his lap and hug him and pray with him. His desire is personal and pastoral. He is sharing the father's comfort with them. But you see here as we progress that there's a slight shift here in verse 5. I think we're going to have to end with this thought and, and take it up next week. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Now this is subtle but significant. Because Paul is not just saying, hey, we all suffer. Life's hard. People get into accidents. Things happen. People die of diseases. War, famine. No, Paul is, is very, being very significant here as he says that his sufferings were of a special kind. This is not just the suffering of cancer or disease or this is a suffering that is associated with the gospel. The suffering that comes by being a Christian. And, and that's where we're going to have to pick it up next week. But what Paul here is saying is that his sufferings were a participation in Christ. And because he participated in Christ's sufferings, get this, he also participated in Christ's comfort. And now the Corinthians, as they have heard the first letter that we have, 1 Corinthians, as they begin to align their lives according to Paul's letter, they will experience hardship. 
as they separate themselves from the world and reform their worship so that it aligns with biblical principle, they will experience the hostility and opposition of the world. And Paul here already prepares them for it and says, join me as we together suffer for Christ. And as we suffer for Christ, I assure you, we will also be comforted from Christ. So brothers and sisters, I look forward to finishing this off next week. And we'll take the next passage from verses 8 through 11 as we look at that together. But to conclude, set this in front of your mind this morning. That your Father in heaven, the Father of Jesus, is the Father of mercy. And he is the God of all comfort. And this letter will have its challenging verses, but never miss the fact that at the start of it is the Father of mercy. And when he hears you cry, pity me, he says, I will, and I have. I have sent my Son to die for you and save you. And that's our hope. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you.